in the previous episode, as we were establishing our presence further in the Nile River, we faced aggression stemming from the river's upper streams. Nubian fleet and fortifications were threatening our settlers and fishers, so we amassed a proper response to their incursions and drove them further out to the yonder cataracts of the mighty Nile. Amenemhat IV, circa 1815 to 1807 before Christ, stepped in in the footsteps of his father, Amenemhat III, and his grandfather, Sanusra III. He finished his father's building projects and launched several military and trade expeditions to secure Egyptian interests within her sphere of influence. Trade was thriving, especially in the cities in the Levant, such as Byblos in modern Lebanon, Amenemhat IV died without a male heir, so his sister, Sobek Nerferu, became the first woman to rule Egypt. Only two years after her succession, she died suddenly without an heir, ending the 12th dynasty. The 13th dynasty was considerably weaker than its predecessor, and Egypt descended into gradual decline. Its rulers, unable to control the whole country, allowed Libyan raiders and migrating semi-nomadic peoples from the northeast to move freely into Lower Egypt and lower relative to the river, meaning down the stream. Of these peoples, the Hyksos were the most dangerous. They started to replace local rulers, creating their own state within Egypt's borders. This period is described as the second intermediate period by historians and lasted until the eviction of the Hyksos many centuries later. Egyptians were early innovators in boat building because of the importance of the Nile for transporting goods and the role of the trade in the Eastern Mediterranean. Naval battles were comparatively rare in Egyptian history. However, as the Egyptians did not have ambitions to become a maritime power during this period, uh, Egypt fought in two notable era battles for the defense of the kingdom. The first was siege of the Hyksos capital, Avaris, between 1570 and 1544 before Christ, when the Egyptians used boats to take control of the canals around the city. The second battle was much later, during the reign of Ramesses III, who fought a naval battle against the pirates and raiders of the sea peoples at the Battle of the Delta, 1175 before Christ. Ramesses won the Battle of Egypt and was one of the few civilizations to survive the initial decades of the Bronze Age collapse, when migrating peoples destroyed most of the established Near Eastern civilizations. Sea warfare of this era revolved primarily around hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Ships closed in on each other and soldiers boarded enemy ships or engaged in missile fire, which was more rare. Ships of that time needed to be fast to catch enemies, but also had to carry a contingent of troops for boarding. Successful battles depended on bringing overwhelming strength to bear on isolated parts of the enemy fleet. Here are some tips for this current campaign. We need to quickly build up our navy to clear the sea of Libyan ships and invade their encampments. The island off your coast is fortified by enemy towers, so be cautious when exploring the water. Woodcutting technologies not only improve your wood gathering rate, but also increases the range of your ships, towers and ranged land units. This makes them very important. After you gain control of the area, especially the sea, Build up an invasion force of chariots, archers and infantry and use transports to carry them to the island. 
You need only to fight your way into the center of the Libyan town, capture the artifact and bring it back to your town center. Destroying all the Libyan units and buildings is not necessary to complete the objectives. There is gold near your town center that can be used to research technologies and storage pit that will improve the fighting ability of your soldiers. So the goal is to recover the stolen artifact and bring it back to our town center. Artifact colors indicate ownership. Artifacts cannot be destroyed. Artifacts can be moved on land or by vessel. What's interesting, I tried to destroy the boat that would, that would uh, be transporting the artifact and artifact would not sink. It would just appear in the nearest shore uh, where the boat sank. Now, when it comes to shipbuilding, the ancient Egyptians were quite skilled. They used a combination of techniques, such as lashing planks together and caulking the seams with reeds and mud. They even had sails made from papyrus and were sturdy enough to catch the wind. If uh, we were to put a price tag on the cost of building an Egyptian warship back then, it would be roughly around 100,000 silver shekels in today's money. Uh, that's a lot of moolah. When it comes to training their naval military, the Egyptians took it very seriously. They would recruit soldiers from all over the country and put them through rigorous training. They would practice rowing, navigation and even hand-to-hand -hand combat for effective boatings. The soldiers who excelled in training were then chosen to become part of the elite naval force, the Sea Peoples. Creative name. They were given the best equipment and training. And for, for the naval battles themselves, well, they were quite epic for those times. The Egyptians would often use their ships to blockade ports and cut off supplies to their enemies. They also used them to transport troops and supplies along the Nile River. And when it comes to uh, the battle, the proper navy battle, the Egyptians would ram their opponent's ships with their own, trying to break them apart. They would also use archers and spearmen to take out the enemy crew. One of the most famous, famous naval battles in Egyptian history was the Battle of the Delta, which took place in 1175 before Christ. The Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses III was able to defeat the invading sea peoples, thanks in part to his superior naval force. The battle was so intense that it was recorded on the walls of Ramesses III's mortuary temple. So picture this, uh, this Battle of the Delta where Pharaoh Ramses III is facing a horde of invading sea peoples. Ramses knows that he must defend his kingdom against these salty dogs, so he gathers his navy and sets sail to meet the enemy in the delta. Now, Ramses is no slouch when it comes to naval warfare. He's got some of the best ships and sailors around, but the sea peoples are a fierce bunch. With their own arsenal and ships and weapons and experience, the, the battle starts off with a bang and both sides ram into each other with all their might. It's chaos in the water. Ships are colliding, men are screaming and swords are clashing, arrows flying. But Ramesses and his crew are determined to win this battle. They fight with everything they've got, using their archers and spearmen to take out the enemy sailors. At one point, Ramses himself picks up a bow and arrow and starts firing away, like some kind of Egyptian Robin Hood. Meanwhile, on the Sea People's ships, things aren't going so well. Their captains are yelling orders left and right, but nobody seems to be listening. Some of the sailors are running around like chickens with their heads cut off, while others are just standing there in shock. One guy even tries to surrender by waving a white flag. But Ramses just laughs and keeps firing arrows at him. What a <laughs> Eventually the battle comes to an end and Ramses emerges victorious. The Sea Peoples retreat, tails between their legs, and Ramses and his crew celebrate their victory with a big feast. There's a roast goat, wine, and some of the exotic fruits that Ramses picked up on his travels and incursions. The sailors swap stories and sing sea shanties late into the night, happy to be alive and victorious, so there's a lot of debauchery and celebration going on. 
After the Battle of the Delta, Ramses III returned to his capital city of Thebes as a victorious hero. He was hailed by the people as a great leader who had defended Egypt against the invading sea peoples. However, while he may have been a mighty warrior, his personal life was a bit more complicated. Ramses III had a large harem of wives and concubines, but he was not always faithful to them. Imagine that. He had many children, but his family life was plagued by scandal and intrigue. One of his wives, Queen Tai, was accused of plotting to assassinate him and take the throne for her son. The plot failed, and Tai was put to death. Despite the drama of his personal life, Ramses III was a, a pretty successful pharaoh overall. He continued to expand Egypt's empire, building new temples and monuments, and strengthening his military. He even had a grand mortuary temple built for himself, where he was buried after his death. However, even in death, Ramses III was not free of drama. When his mummy was redis rediscovered in the 19th century, it was found to have a large wound in the throat. Some scholars believe that Ramses III was actually assassinated, possibly one of, by one of his own wives or sons. Others think that the wound was simply a result of the mummification process. So while Ramses III may have been a successful pharaoh and a great warrior, his personal life was far from perfect. But again, whose is? Yeah, politics of the ancient world was pretty messed up. Glad we don't have anything like that today, huh? Well, uh, to switch gears, Ramses III is known to have had a large harem of wives and concubines, as mentioned previously. Although the exact number is unclear, some estimates suggest that uh, he may have had as many as 200 wives and concubines, but others suggest a number smaller. But regardless, it was a significant number, greater than one. In ancient Egypt, the king or pharaoh was expected to have many wives and concubines as a symbol of their power and wealth. The women in the harem would have been selected from among the daughters of noble families or even foreign princesses. So it is... Um, the process of selection was quite political, uh, at least very likely it was very political, as the women would have been chosen for their social status, beauty, and ability to produce children. It is unclear how the women in Ramses III's harem interacted with each other. They may have been divided into two different groups based on their status and the number of children they had with the pharaoh. Some of the women may have been more influential than others, depending on their connections and political savvy. As for the juicy details, there are some stories that suggest Ramses III's harem was a hotbed of intrigue and scandal. One of his wives, Queen Tai, was accused of plotting to assassinate him to take the throne for her son. The plot failed, and Tai was put to death, as mentioned previously. Another wife, a woman named Taosret, may have been involved in a power struggle with one of the Ramses III's sons after his death. While these stories may be interesting, it's important to remember that they're based on fragment, uh, fragmentary historical evidence and may not tell the full story. Uh, the reality of life in Ramses III's harem was likely more complex and nuanced than the sensational stories that have been passed down through the ages. In ancient Egypt, the harem of a pharaoh was a complex institution that included not only the pharaoh's wives and concubines, but also their attendants, servants, and other members of the household. The exact organization of the harem is unclear, but it is likely that uh, there were different levels of hierarchy and that various officials were responsible for managing different aspects of the harem. So it was a, a, like a non-profit organization of today. Probably, probably tax advantaged, if you know what I mean. Well, the pharaoh's wives and concubines would have been cared for by the staff of attendants and servants who would have provided them with food, clothing and other necessities. Some of the women in the harem may have had their own personal attendants or handmaidens. It is possible that there were different levels of luxury and comfort within the harem, with some women living in more opulent surroundings than others. In terms of the differences between wives and concubines, 
In ancient Egypt, a wife was a woman who was officially married to the pharaoh and had a recognized status as queen. She um, would have been involved in pharaoh's public life and may have had some degree of political influence. A concubine, on the other hand, was a woman who was not officially married to the pharaoh but had a sexual relationship with him. So she, wouldn't, she would not have had the same status or rights as a wife and would not have been involved in the pharaoh's public life, uh, but would be involved nonetheless. It is worth noting that the distinction between wives and concubines was not always clear in ancient Egypt, and some women may have had a hybrid status that was somewhere in between the two. Additionally, the exact nature of the relationships between the pharaoh and the women in his harem is not fully understood and may have varied from one pharaoh to another, depending on the preferences. And usually what happened in harem stayed in harem. Well, as the ruler of one of the wealthiest and most powerful civilizations of the ancient world, the pharaohs of Egypt lived a life of extreme luxury and extravagance. Their lifestyle was characterized by opulent palaces, elaborate gardens, and a constant flow of expensive goods and services. Uh, in principle, the same thing as today. In terms of their homes, the pharaohs lived in grand palaces that were filled with beautiful furnishings, precious metals, and rare artifacts. They would have had access to the finest items, including food, drink, exotic fruits, meats, and wines uh, delivered from different parts of the empire, even from beyond it. They would have also had a retinue of attendants, including cooks, servants, and entertainers who were uh, around the pharaoh to cater for every need. The pharaohs also had a love for f fine clothing and jewelry. They would have um, worn elaborate headdresses, collars, bracelets, and other items made of gold, silver, and precious stones. They also had a love for perfumes and cosmetics, and would have used a variety of exotic scents and ointments to enhance their appearance and scent. So really, nothing's changed <laughs> since the ancient times, uh, in principle. Technology has certainly changed. In terms of leisure activities, the pharaohs enjoyed hunting, fishing and boating, as well as music and dance performances. They also had access to elaborate gardens and parks filled with exotic plants and animals. When we consider modern luxury lifestyle, the pharaoh's extravagance can be translated into a number of ways. So modern luxury lifestyles may include owning multiple homes, private jets, yachts and luxury cars, they may also include access to the finest restaurants, spa treatments and personal trainers, fine art, ex exquisite and exclusive experiences. Designer clothing and accessories are also part of this modern luxury lifestyle. In many ways, the modern concept of luxury has been influenced by the lifestyles of the pharaohs and other historical rulers who lived lives of great excess and indulgence. While the specifics may be different, the desire of the finest goods and um, as well as services remains a constant element of the luxury lifestyle. But compared to the ending of the pharaoh's lives, he lived a pretty opulent life but also had a lot of intrigues because of the many people who uh, probably were jealous of his position and power and wealth. So it ended up producing a lot of strife within his own family where his closest people, including his own wives and uh, probably heirs, were after his life. It's kind of a tough trade-off. Uh, also an interesting topic is um, economic equivalency in modern-day dollars. It is difficult to estimate Ramses III's net worth in today's dollars, as the concept of net worth did not ex quite exist in the ancient Egypt, uh, and the economic systems were very, very different. Uh, additionally, while Ramses III was undoubtedly one of the wealthiest individuals of his time, it is impossible to know the exact value of his assets and resources. That being said, 
historical historians have attempted to estimate the wealth of the pharaohs of the ancient Egypt uh, based on the resources and treasures they accumulated during the, the reigns. For example, some estimates suggest that the temple of Karnak, which Ramses III greatly expanded and embellished, um, may have been worth as much as 15 billion dollars in today's uh, money in terms of its construction costs and the value of the treasures and resources it contained. However, it's important to keep in mind that these estimates are highly speculative and based on a number of assumptions and approximations. The value of wealth and resources can also be greatly uh, different over time and in different economic contexts. So attempting to convert Ramses III's network to modern dollars is a challenging task. Also, slavery was a thing back then where human beings were sold and procured for uh, life essentially and they were the slaves for as long as the master lived and a lot of the uh, conquered peoples would be subject to the slavery conditions where individuals such as Pharaoh or even his elites would own quite a lot of slaves to perform duties for free essentially. They would be responsible for feeding them, providing shelter, but that's about it. No civil liberties, no freedoms as we know it. So the ancient world, particularly ancient Egypt, was a very very different place, but it's part of human history. Also noteworthy that um, the slavery in ancient, in ancient Egypt was very different from what we understand as uh, from the transatlantic slave trade uh, because the um, slavery was not based on race quote unquote and people of all ethnicities and nationalities could become slaves including Egyptians themselves most slaves in Egypt were captives of war and people who were sold into slavery due to debts or crimes. Uh, slaves could also be born into slavery in their, if their parents were slaves. Slaves in ancient Egypt were considered to be the property of their owners and had few rights. Uh, they were often forced to perform hard labor, such as working in the fields, quarries, mines. Some slaves were also employed as domestic servants and were responsible for tasks such as cooking, cleaning and taking care of children. Despite of the harsh conditions, it is worth noting that the lines of slaves in ancient Egypt were not necessarily as, mis uh, as miserable as those of slaves in more recent history. Slaves in ancient Egypt were often treated relatively well, and some were able to rise to positions of power and influence. For example, some high-ranking officials in ancient Egypt were slaves, who had been granted their freedom due to their loyalty and service to their masters. So a very different institution, again, from what we understand from the transatlantic slave trade in Americas. Um, in terms of the conditions for ending slavery, it was possible for slaves in ancient Egypt to obtain their freedom under certain circumstances. Slaves could be um, manumitted by their owners, also, either as a reward for loyal service or a form of charity. Additionally, slaves could sometimes buy their freedom if they were able to save up enough money or if their owners were willing to sell them. In some cases, slaves were also able to escape and find refuge in other areas of the country, though it was very risky and difficult endeavor. Overall, while slavery was an accepted practice in ancient Egypt, the specific conditions and treatment of slaves varied greatly depending on the individual circumstances and the attitude of the owners. Additionally, artifacts were of great significance in ancient Egyptian society as they were considered to be tangible representations of the beliefs, values and achievements of the culture. Many ancient Egyptian artifacts were created as religious or funerary objects that were designed to facilitate the transition of the deceased into the afterlife. For example, statues of gods and goddesses were often placed in temples or tombs to honor the, de the deities and to ensure their favor, while amulets and other small objects were buried with the dead to provide protection and guidance in the afterlife. In addition to the religious and funerary functions, 
artifacts in ancient Egypt were also served as symbols of power and status. The pharaohs and other members of the ruling elite commissioned many elaborate objects, including jewelry, furniture and other decorative items, as a means of showcasing their wealth and influence. These objects were often crafted from precious metals and gemstones and were embellished in order to in indicate status and significance with intricate designs and hieroglyphic inscriptions that bore some meaning uh, in the religious or individual contexts. Artifacts also played a significant role in preserving the historical and cultural heritage of ancient Egypt. Many artifacts, such as papyri, uh, pottery, tools, provide valuable insights into the daily life, technology, and beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. In addition, the discovery of many major archaeological finds, such as the tomb of Tutankhamun and the Rosetta Stone, have greatly expanded our knowledge and understanding of ancient Egypt. Overall, the artifacts of ancient Egypt were highly valued for their aesthetic, religious, social and historical significance. They remain a source of fascination and study for scholars and laypeople alike. And, of course, you are my sophisticated audience. And they continue to provide insight into one of the most enduring and influential civilizations in human history. All right, <clears throat> looks like our campaign is coming to an end. We have conquered the island in the middle of the river, as well as the main base of the Libyan raiders. Now it's time to, to land the artifact in the designated area. And I think that we are also able to win this match by destroying all of the buildings of the enemy. But that might not be the case, we'll see. In some campaigns it is. But um, it is time to bring the artifact back to the indicated area. I hope that you have enjoyed the stories that have compiled about the ancient Egyptian society, the role that military and artifacts played in the development thereof, and we only have two more campaigns left for Ascent of Egypt before its descent. By the way, let me know down in the section, in the comment section below, if you have any fun facts about ancient Egypt that I didn't cover in this or the previous episodes. I'd be interested to know, because this is a fascinating civilization that brought to the world a lot of its initial discoveries, inventions, and societal structures, with its problems, of course. And also let me know which campaigns you would like me to cover next. It can include the Age of Empires 1 Definitive Edition, but also can include Age of Empires 2. Alright, thanks a lot. The Libyan raiders are defeated and their ships burned. It is unlikely that this will be the end of them, however. As long as the trade between Egypt and her neighbors prospers, there will always be those wanting to steal our wealth.